Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're going to talk about muscle tissue. Uh, before we get into the muscle anatomy, we talk about just muscle as a tissue. So there's three different types of muscle tissue. You have skeletal tissue uh, or skeletal muscle tissue, which is what we mainly talk about in college anatomy and physiology, the basic anatomy and physiology. Once you move on to human physiology or other college classes, you'll talk about the other ones more in, in depth. But uh, as for right now, we mainly talk about skeletal muscle tissue, but we also touch upon cardiac muscle tissue and smooth muscle tissue as well. So in skeletal muscle tissue, obviously that's for our movement. It is there um, to attach the skeletal system, allows us to move, and uh, it includes uh, only skeletal muscles when we talk about uh, the muscular system. Uh, six functions of the skeletal muscle tissue, uh, you know, to produce skeletal movement, maintain posture or your body position, support soft tissues, guard entrances and exits, maintain body temperature and store nutrient reserves. Skeletal muscle, when we talk about it, it includes the connective tissues, the nerves and the blood vessels all associated with the muscle tissue. There are three coverings or connective tissue that is associated with the muscle. You have the epimyceum, which is on the outside, the perimyceum, which is in the middle, and then endomyceum, which is on the inside. And we'll see that in just a moment, what I mean by that. The epimyceum is an exterior collagen layer, and then perimyceum surrounds muscle fibers or, or fascicles, and then you have the endomyceum, which is going to surround individual muscle cells or muscle fibers. So we see here we have an entire uh, muscle that we will will say um, and the outer layer right here is the epimyceum and then surrounding these fascicles all right so this is a muscle fascicle surrounding that this will be our paramyceum and then within that you have individual muscle fibers all right so our, our paramyceum is going to be around our muscle fascicles or, or bundles of fibers and then our individual muscle fibers will be surrounded by our endomyceum these are connective tissues that come together at the ends of tissues um, and you know it ultimately Connective tissue is important in forming our tendons and our aponeurosis or aponeuroses. Blood vessels and nerves are an important part. They're going to supply oxygen and nutrients where we're going to see that this is very important when we talk about we need oxygen for our ATP, okay, aerobic respiration, and um, nutrients. We need plenty of uh, calcium and we need plenty of sodium. We're going to get into that in a moment. And it's going to carry away our waste. Remember, CO2 is a waste product. And when we talk about skeletal muscles, this is our voluntary muscles controlled by nerves of the central nervous system, our brain, as well as our spinal cord. So here it shows you just a muscle fiber. It has, it's uh, really our, 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 muscle cells so we don't really necessarily call them you know cells of the muscular system we call them muscle fibers but they are uh, if you want to think of it as they are muscle cells so our muscle fibers they ha contain components just like cells contain components they're going to have many mitochondria we need many mitochondria because we are making ATP and they are going to have these myofibrils which are like miniature fibers within them they're going to have this plasma membrane which we call the sarcolemma we're going to see striations because of the way that they work and we have many nuclei they're multi-nucleate cells and then we have these myosatellite cell cells which are going to be for regeneration and really repair is what we're talking about repairing our skeletal muscle tissues and these cells we always think about cells as being very small but these are they are very small they're very thin but they can be up to 30 centimeters in length so that's the the length of a ruler you're going to see that uh, these components are throughout skeletal muscle so when we see these striations we are talking about skeletal muscle tissue skeletal muscle cells skeletal, uh, skeletal muscle fibers this is a microscopic view of our myofibrils or, or our 
muscle fibers with the myofibrils within them. We see our striations. We see our, our nuclei. We have our sarcolemma, which is going to surround our muscle fibers within them. We have a cytoplasm, which in muscle cells we call a sarcoplasm. We have these transverse T tubules, which are very important in sending messages, making sure that whichever message we're trying to send, whether we want to contract that muscle or relax that muscle, it's going to be sent throughout the entire length of that muscle. So these T tubules are very important. Myofibros we talked about, and within the myofibros, we have these functional units. They are called sarcomeres, and the sarcomeres are made up of thin filaments and thick filaments. Our thin filaments are made of actin, and our thick filaments are made of myosin. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, just like our endoplasmic reticulum in our skeletal muscle cells or, or our muscle fibers, we have a sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it is a uh, membranous structure surrounding each myofibril, helps transmit that action potential. So we need that sarcoplasmic reticulum. We need those T tubules. And um, it helps form chambers, which we call our terminal cisternae, which attach, attach to the T tubules. So we need our terminal cisternae and our T tubules uh, in our sarcoplasmic reticulum in order for that actual action potential or that, that message to be sent down the muscle fiber. We call this the triad because three, triad means three, it is going to have our T tubule, one T tubule, and two terminal cisternae. Uh, the cisternae, they concentrate uh, calcium ions, Ca2 plus, VN ion pumps. They release the calcium ions into the functional units, into those sarcomeres to begin muscle contractions. Here we see a individual uh, myo, myofibril um, right here. So this is our muscle fiber and within there we have our myofibril and if we look we see these squiggly line and there's going to be actually another one over here if we were to cut this away. And from here to here is our sarcomere. And like I said, our sarcomere is made up of thin filaments and thick filaments. We have our actin and we have our myosin. And these are really what are going to be contraction, contracting. So if this contracts and then a por portion down the way contracts and then the next portion from here to here contracts and then the portion from here to here contracts and we see all of them here, 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 all of these are contracting and these little functional units are contracting, then the entire muscle is able to contract. This is our myofibro. We're going to talk about our sarcomeres. So these are the structural units of muscles. We see that <clears throat> as far as needing the muscle to contract, we need these all of these sarcomeres to collectively contract, and that's why we need our triad in order for them to all work together and for it to simultaneously contract and simultaneously relax. Um, we break up these sarcomeres into A bands and I bands, where we see these thick filaments and these thin filaments. And we further break it up into an M line where we see it's the center of the A band. We have an H band, which is the area around the M line. And then we have these zone, uh, a zone of overlap. You have a Z line that centers on the I band. And then you have Titan, um, which is uh, strands of proteins. So here you go. This is just how we break it up. We have our myosin, which is the purple. And the green is our actin. Um, and our myosin, this area is going to be called the A-band. We have our actin here is called the I-band, and we have these lines. So from here to here is one sarcomere, and then from here on down this way is going to be another sarcomere, and from here this way is going to be another sarcomere, and it'll continue and, and continue. So we break it up where we see uh, this area where our myosin ends here and this myosin ends here. We see that this is called the I band. Um, we have an H band where they do not touch. This is our Z line, our Titan protein molecules, and all of these are made up of thin and thick filaments. 
So here it just kind of shows you how we have an entire muscle cell that we went over, entire uh, muscle, I should say, muscle organ, and it's covered in, in epimysium, and then we have these muscle fascicles covered in the paramysium, and then we have muscle fibers covered in endomysium, and in the muscle fibers we have myofibrils, and, and in the myofibrils we have many, many repeating functional units which are called sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are responsible for contraction. We have actin, okay, two twisted rows of of uh, globular G actin is our F actin, and the active sites on G actin strands bind to the myosin. So the actin, the actin, and the myosin need to band together in order to contract. Nebulin holds F actin, or our double, our, our double twisted rows of globular G actin strands together. So we have tropomyosin and we have troponin. All right, we need these two things in order to see the contraction to occur. So what happens actually is we have this these myosin and we have this actin and this is actin right here and it shows it right here. But actin, it the active site of actin is not exposed. So this myosin cannot attach to it. So in order for it to attach to it, we need to move this tropomyosin out of the way. So this tropomyosin is covering the active site of the actin. So in order for us to really connect the myosin heads to the to this actin active site, we need to remove this tropomyosin. And in order to remove that tropomyosin, we need calcium ions, Ca2 plus ions, in, to bond with this troponin. Once they bond, the troponin is able to pull that tropomyosin away from the active site. And by pulling that tropomyosin away from the active site, now these heads are able to attach to the actin. So we have these calcium-2 binds to the receptors of the troponin, and it pulls that tropomyosin away from the active site so that we have our myosin heads connecting to that actin. Here is our myosin. All right, so we have our myosin tail and our myosin head, and these myosin heads are constantly moving if we have ATP. So if you want to think about ATP, it is adenosine with three phosphate groups on it. So one, two, three. In order to get energy, we have to break this bond right here, and we make ADP or adenosine diphosphate, two phosphate groups. So that's constantly going on. We constantly need oxygen and ATP for this, and we constantly need that calcium in order for this to go on. So when you die, you are no longer producing that, that ATP. You're no longer taking in that oxygen, and these are actually freeze up where they are, and that's why we see that people, uh, their, their muscles stay contracted and they don't free up for quite some time. So we call this the sliding filament theory, the idea that we have these, these myosin heads that are connecting to the active site of the uh, actin, and that is what's doing it. So these are constantly moving. All right? If you think about in a video game, if when you had to push a wall that was pushing back on you, you, you know, I always tell people you, you had to keep hitting the A button or it would push back on you. So you'd hit A, 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 and it would slowly push that wall if you continue to hit a, 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 and that's what's going on with this. These heads are constantly pulling these, this act in this way, and these heads are pulling this act in this way so that eventually, or well, it happens rather quickly, but it they have to keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling until it contracts and these actin meet at the middle, and now that sarcomere, that functional unit, is able to come in, but it takes these these uh, myosin heads to constantly be grabbing at the actin and, and letting go and grabbing, letting go and grabbing until everything is contracted in order for a contraction to occur, and this has to happen all the way down the myofibril. So this shows it at rest where our H-band is far apart, where our actins are not touching, but what we're doing is we're contracting, and the actin get closer to each other. So um, when we talk about this occurring, we need to then talk about, well, how does it all happen? Well, it takes the nervous system, it takes your brain, it takes your spinal cord to send that, that message down in order to start the whole process, in order for the ATP to uh, break the bonds and for the calcium to bond with the, the, the troponin in order to move the tropomyosin away from the actin uh, act, uh, active site. So 
we have a neuromuscular junction, a junction where the, the neuron meets the muscle, and that's how uh, intercellular communication happens between the nervous system and the skeletal muscle fibers, and it, it controls the calcium ions released into the sarcoplasm in order for those calcium ions to bond with the troponin so that the tropomyosin can be removed from the, uh, the active site of the actin so that those myosin heads can, uh, can uh, uh, bind with the, the actin. So here this shows you a diagram. We have our neuron right here and it is sending a message or we like to call it an action potential down to the uh, motor end plate or the, the area where the, the neuron is going to touch the, the muscle. And that motor end plate from there is then going to send that message down the entire length of that muscle. So here you see that um, we've talked about calcium ions and we've talked about ATP. Well, now we have to talk about acetylcholine. Okay, we have to talk about acetylcholinesterase. And we also have to talk about sodium ions. So on, when we talk about the muscle, we're talking about calcium and ATP are major components. We also need oxygen, obviously. But then when we're talking about the neuromuscular junc junction, we need to talk about sodium and our acetylcho uh, acetylcholine. So the cytoplasm of the axon, all right, we, we're going to see that um, it contains these vesicles with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. It's going to be a chemical messenger and released by a neuron. It's going to change the permeability of that cell's plasma membrane, and uh, the motor end plate contains molecules of the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. So we have our acetylcholine here, and we have our acetylcholinesterase uh, inside this uh, this neuromuscular junction, this synaptic cleft that we like to call it. And the stimulus for acetylcholine release is the arrival of an electric impulse or an action potential. So coming, there's an action potential coming from the brain, coming from the spinal cord, and, and it's really like an, an, an electrical charge. So when that charge comes, it's telling to change the, uh, the, uh, the permeability of that cell membrane. And the action potential is a sudden change in that membrane potential so that um, we're going to see, you know, further change as we we move. So we have a change in the action potential and a, an, a, an arriving action potential. We have these these vesicles filled with acetylcholine, and then through excitocytosis, ex, once we get that ac, that uh, action potential, it's going to release the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is then going to uh, go into this synaptic cleft right here. And the acetylcholine molecules are going to diffuse across that synaptic cleft, and it's going to uh, bind to acetylcholine receptors. These are our receptors. They have to be the same, sh same shape. So we're going to see that binding occur. And that's going to actually change the permeability of the muscle's uh, membrane. And, and that's where we're going to see now sodium an influx or a, a vast amount of sodium is going to be moved in and that's going to create an action potential within there so as we see that the action potential comes down from the acetylcholine through the the axon now we're going to have an influx or a lot of sodium ions they are positively charged that's why we write that na plus and all these charged pot particles are going to create a a a uh, membrane potential or a, a, a giant charge in there and that's going to further send that information down. So now we have an action potential. Sometimes they'll show it in a graph where you'll see that you're sitting at about negative 20 millivolts and then once we get that influx of sodium it's going to bring bring it to about positive 30 millivolts and then we can start that all over again. So the sudden inrush of sodium ions results in the the action potential in the sarcolemma. Uh, acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft in two ways. It's going to uh, either diffuse away from the synapse or is broken down uh, by the acetylcholine uh, esterase, that, that enzyme right here that's going to help break it down into acetic acid and choline. And this removes the uh, and inactivates the uh, acetylcholine. And the muscle fiber picture, uh, 
indicates that the that the action potential along this sarcolemma. So we see that um, the action potential is going to move along once it is over. And you know we call this excitation coupling, where then eventually it's going to reach the triad, and there's going to be the release of the calcium ions, and the calcium ions are going to cause that that uh, binding with the troponin so that we can remove that tropomyosin away from the active site of the actin and then it is going to be able to uh, connect with those myosin heads. Okay, So this is kind of just a quick rundown of everything that I just said. It is neural control. It, we, see, we need that uh, acetylcholine. We need the uh, those sodium ions, we, then we need the calcium ions, and we also need ATP and oxygen in this whole thing. So Contraction cycle, you're going to see contraction begins, then the active site exposure, the cross bridge formation, myosin heads are moving or pivoting, and then the cross bridge detachment, and then myosin reactivation. This happens in a split second, that's how we're able to move, but if you don't, uh, you know, but it is a matter of steps. If one of the steps does not work, then that contraction is not going to occur. We need our triad, we need the, that acetylcholine, we need the, the the sodium, we need the calcium, we need the ATP, we need the oxygen. All of these things are important, and that's why we need to make sure that we have these nutrients and we are able to circulate them through the body, and that's why you need to make sure you have proper calcium intake and, and sodium intake and everything else. And this is just a you know a rundown of what I just said. So you have those myosin heads, and we need that calcium ions in order to move that, that tropomyosin away from the act, active site of the actin. And then you're going to see that once it is removed, those heads can connect to the, to the actin and they can move that actin and continue to pivot and push that actin. So we have a resting sarcomere like this, and then we are going to contract that sarcomere, and you're going to see that the fibers are going to shorten. We have resting, and then we have contracting. All right, so relaxation is when we stop contracting. And it really depends on the duration of the neural stimulus, the number of free calcium ions in the sarcoplasm, and the availability of ATP and oxygen. So during relaxation, the calcium ion concentration falls. The calcium ions then detach from the troponin and the tropomyosin and then recovers the active site of the actin. In rigor mortis, a fixed muscular contraction after death, that's what rigor mortis is, it causes is caused when ion pumps cease to function and you run out of ATP and the calcium binds up in the sarcoplasm and causes that muscle to stay contracted. All right. So in summary, skeletal muscle fibers shorten as thin filaments slide between thick filaments. You need that free cal those free calcium ions in the sarcoplasm plasm, plasm triggers contraction. The sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium when a motor neuron stimulates the muscle fiber. Contraction is an act active process. Relaxation and return to resting length are passive, although they still need the calcium and the ATP. This is another diagram showing you the whole process, just running through it again. And we see contraction and relaxation. So, um, relaxation. So, cardiac muscle is another type. They are striated and found only in the heart. Striations are similar to that of skeletal muscle because the internal arrangement of myofilaments are, is similar. Um, unlike skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle cells are small, have only a single nucleus, have short and wide T tubules. They don't have the triads that we talked about. Have a sarcoplasmic reticulum with no terminal cisternae. That's why we don't have the triads. They are aerobic. Okay, they need lots. Of, they have mito, uh, mitochondria. They need lots of oxygen, and they have intercalated discs. So intercalated discs are a major component of the cardiac muscle tissue. Um, they're specialized contact points between the car cardiocytes. So you're not thinking about making sure your heart is pumping just like, uh, you know, it's very different from how you think about moving my arms, moving my legs. Okay, so in order for your heart to continue to pump on its own, we need these intercalated di discs. And the, the function is to maintain the structure, enhance uh, molecular and electrical uh, connections, and it condu conducts that action potential uh, forever and ever for the rest of your life. So if you think about it, we rest most of our muscles, but your heart never, ever gets a rest. It is always working, and it needs uh, those action potentials to always be going. Here we see a microscopic uh, section of cardiac muscle. 
diagram. So cardiac muscle has automaticity and contraction without neural stimulation controlled by pacemaker, which we'll talk about, or pacemaker cells, which we'll talk about later in the year. But just important to understand that this cardiac muscle is working on its own and is somewhat different from uh, skeletal muscle. Then you have smooth body muscle in the body system, uh, forms around other tissues. It is going to be involuntary. So we're going to see it in our, uh, when we have goosebumps from our erector pili muscles, we're going to see it in our blood vessels and our, our airways, regulates our blood pressure and our airflow. We're going to see it um, uh, in reproductive and glandular systems, digestive system is a big one, and even urinary system. So keep these things in mind as we move on. Make sure that you understand the sliding filament theory, the whole idea behind the actin and the myosin linking up by having the calcium and the calcium pulling the tropomyosin away by using the troponin.